Now, the data from Vera Rubin, which I'm very excited about this telescope. Right. This telescope is already delivering and it's in testing, <laughs> but yet there's already scientifically usable data and it's already discovered 2000 asteroids just on a test run. I mean, it's just amazing. And just the idea of a survey <laughs> telescope like that is just exciting because you get to see the, you get to see things moving. And that's what we see with the interstellar optics as they move through. But what in this data is it further indicates for the Vera Rubin telescope data that this is indeed a comet. What what's telling you? What do you see that's consistent in that data set from the new paper, which there will be a link in the description below that's saying you know, this is consistent with a comet. Right. Yeah. And you you basically said this, but it's worth it is worth stating that the the data that we got of 3i Atlas from Rubin it wasn't even in the LSST. So it wasn't even in the big survey that they have planned because that hasn't started. These are just essentially just, you already, you mentioned it, right? But it's essentially just testing images. So they were doing what they call science validation. It's that's the stage that they were at in like at June, July. So they were just looking at doing kind of preliminary testing of the camera and things like calibration, stuff like that. And then we, we, we totally independently and just remarkable, remarkable coincidence is that Atlas discovered this crazy interstellar object right after Rubin was getting first light. But really remember, this is not as powerful as what the survey, it's not operating like what it will be in the future, which is going to be much more powerful. So it's remarkable. It's a remarkable testament to the Vera Rubin Observatory just in general that we were able to get anything from just the science validation images. But we ended up basically getting I forget the exact number, but we were able, we got images of the comet from back to, I think it was June 21st, I think is the first one we got. So yeah, 2025, June 21st, all the way through July 7th, almost every night, we got recovery images of the object from essentially just engineering time, which is remarkable. And it is also worth saying that Atlas did a phenomenal job in finding this object. So Although, John, I love your excitement, and I, I have been on this show before, and we have done entire episodes just about Ruben and how amazing LSST is going to be, it is worth giving credit right now to Atlas, which is still going to be operating and very well could find more interstellar objects in the future. So I think, uh, you know, Atlas really did a great job here. But yeah, so we got, basically, there were several people who were leading this amazing effort with the Ruben Observatory, because... It was, so the paper's on archive now, but it was a huge, huge effort. You'll probably be able to see that there's hundred, there's 150 or more people on the paper, but really Colin Chandler, Pedro Bernardinelli and Mario Jurek and uh, Meg Schwamm did this huge effort just to put everything together in a very short amount of time. And it's, you know, these days it's exciting, things are exciting, but also the pressure's on because like, you want to get the information out to everybody else in the community as quickly as possible so that we can all kind of plan our follow-up observations while we have the chance to observe this object. So it's kind of time critical to get this stuff out as quickly as possible. And because the survey was operating at a science validation stage, it was non-trivial. Like they didn't expect to have to release any of the data, let alone publish it. So it was a huge lift just to jump through all of the hoops for this unprecedented discovery just to be able to publish this and put it on archives so that all the other scientists could take a look at it and people in the public can take a look at it. But what we were able to see is, I mean, there's pretty clear evidence of cometary activity in the Rubin data. And it's kind of some of the early, it's some of the earliest pre-covery images we have on 3i Atlas from a large eight meter class telescope. So that's there's lots of exciting things that we'll be able to do and continue to be able to do with something as powerful as the Vera Rubin Observatory looking at this object. But uh, it's great to see it so far, what they've been able to do just with the pre-covery stuff. Reactive science. You only have so much time. Yeah. This thing cooking through, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and this time we saw one coming in as opposed to like a Momo, which was on its way out when it was spotted by Panstars and University of Hawaii, as you mentioned, Karen Meach. The thing is, though, this one is coming in, so we can watch its evolution as it as it moves through the solar system and then leaves it. And I know also another reactive thing is the Hubble Space Telescope is going to take a look and hopefully get a high quality image. Is there any idea on the time frame on that? Yeah. So to your first point, you're absolutely right. So it is 
I, all I could say is remarkably fortuitous, but it's, yeah, just remarkably fortuitous that we caught it coming in and not only coming in close, I mean, at 4.2 AU, like, you know, it's just like hats off to Atlas. It's just remarkable that they, they were. It is remarkable and it gives us months. Yes, you know, exactly. Months. <laughs> yeah, so we have months to observe it. And, you know, Borisov, we had months to observe, but then there was the COVID pandemic, which shut down basically all the ground-based facilities, which is just terrible timing. But so Atlas, it's 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 lucky in that we caught it as it's entering and as it's, a, you know, 4AU. But it's also, remember, this thing is moving crazy fast. So because it's moving so fast, we don't have that much time. And so it's going to have perihelion and the fall. But the problem is that it kind of goes from the Earth's. It's a bad apparition with respect to the Earth. So like we won't be able to observe it during its perihelion in the fall, but then it'll pop back out in November and we'll be able to see it. So we'll have lots of time to get observations of it, but it's not as ideal as we'd like it to be. And then you asked about the Hubble Space Telescope observations. I have not seen those yet, but Dave Jewett was able to immediately obtain a, I guess, a director's discretionary time. So he basically immediately convinced HST to look at the object. And I believe his observations started last night. So, and last night, I mean, I, I know this episode is going to be released after, so we can look up the exact dates with respect to when you air this episode. But so he would have just gotten it, I guess, very recently. He He is kind of a ninja when it comes to the telescope. So he can usually get stuff out and get information out to the public very quickly, but it'll take him at least a couple days to reduce the data and take a look. So I think I would expect hearing more about the Hubble results on a timeline of something like three weeks, but I would say, don't quote me on that, but I guess we're recording. So you'll quote me on that, but. Well, I can say this, I can, for, for, for reference, it is Monday, July 21st. Right. Yeah. So hopefully we'll learn in the next couple of weeks, but you know, Dave did, Dave was able to get a huge amount of information from the Hubble images that he got, then the Hubble data that he got on 2i Borisov. So just from the Hubble data alone, he was able to figure out the size of the nucleus, basically. So he wasn't able to nail it. I mean, nobody was able to nail it down completely, but he was able to put independently put upper and lower limits on the size of the nucleus. So we know that it was kind of in the sub-kilometer range, like 200 to 800 meters-ish. Learn also he was able to from his Hubble data kind of predict that a breakup was going to occur, which it then did. So he's kind of a I mean, there's a reason he's a super famous observer, but he kind of is able to get a lot out of data, even when you have a unfortunate. I mean, it's remarkable we observe this, but in some aspects, some some aspects of the geometry or of the apparition are somewhat unfortunate. So I have full faith that someone like Dave is going to be able to get as much out of the the space-based assets that we currently have as possible. Now, is there any advantage, and people are specifically going to ask this, so I'm going to ask it, is there any advantage that the James Webb Space Telescope, which also has some built-in time for serendipitous events where it can swing around and look, is there any advantage for that telescope to take a look at an interstellar comet like this? Yes, yeah, certainly. I think... The best way to think about it, though, is not like a competition of which asset is the most important to look at it. It's just more like, how do we get the most comprehensive wavelength and resolution and coverage of this interesting object that everybody is interested in? Because, you know, that was part of the reason of, I basically opened up the author list on the paper that I wrote that ended up being one of the discovery papers to anybody who was interested and wanted to collaborate and wanted to publish their data quickly because, we're all in, like everybody in the world who's, every astronomer and amateur astronomers too, right? Like everybody is looking at this object. We're all collectively interested and there's no reason to be competitive about things. Like we just, the goal should be that collectively we get as many photons of this object from as many different wavelength regimes as we can so that we can learn enough because in six months, we're never going to be able to look at it again. And this is one of the most fantastic small bodies we've ever observed passing through the solar system. So I think that's the way to look at it. And HST, right, I think is mostly looking like the unique thing that HST offers is space-based ultraviolet observations. It can do infrared stuff, but it is unique in that it is the only really real, like it is, it is unmatched capabilities at ultraviolet wavelengths in space. And then 
the James Webb Space Telescope, what that will really be great at is looking in the infrared. So I think they're comp basically, they're entirely complementary. So we want as much time as possible on both JWST and HST and at, and at as many different points in the trajectory of 3i Atlas as possible. Because, you know, things change in comets. When comets, you already hinted at this, John, but when, or you said it, like when comets get closer to the sun and further away, they change and they have different ices that activate. And that can tell you about things like what is the composition of the nucleus that it formed with and also how deep are the different layers of those ices. And then some of those ices you can only see in with JWST in the infrared and some of the ices you can only see in ultraviolet wavelengths. So there's kind of really compelling science to be done with both of those assets. Does the infrared profile change as a comet gets closer to the sun? In other words, warming it, does it, does, do you see it brighter in infrared as it gets closer to the sun or is it just simply too cold? No, you'll see that. So with the infrared measurements, you can potentially, especially if it's inert. So if there's no cometary activity, you can, based on how bright it's shining in the infrared at different wavelengths, you can do things like constrain the albedo because it's, you know, thermal, because it's just heating up and reflect and uh, emitting. So you can do stuff like constrain the albedo and the thermal properties of the nucleus. But in the case of a comet, I think what's what we're expecting is you spectroscopically with JWST detect things like maybe H2O or CO2 or CO. So water, carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide directly being outgassed. And that for sure would change. Like we, that is, that is not, um, that's not even contentious. So we see this happening. We see comets, the, for example, the, production rate of something like, per, by production rate, I mean how many molecules per second, but you'll see things like the production rate of water changing over time and the production rate of CO2 changing over time. And that's because as you get closer to the sun, it's receiving more solar photons. So they're, you're able, you're literally able to sublimate, sublimate more of that ice. And, to, and it, it just, as it goes through its trajectory, it goes it's probing deeper and deeper layers from the top of the comet nucleus. So you're seeing deeper and deeper into the nucleus of the comet as it sublimates. 